Good morning. Welcome as we come together in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's good to be here. It's good to welcome you if this is not your normal place of worship. It's good to welcome you if you're joining us online as well. Can I give you a couple of announcements to begin with? One is to remember for church members, we have a members meeting on Wednesday evening. Um, You should have received all the paperwork for that. If you haven't yet or haven't been able to access that, please speak to Doug uh, today and he'll sort sort that out for you. And also to mention um, that next weekend is Easter weekend. There's a couple of changes or different things to to normal because it's Easter weekend. One is um, Good Friday service at 10 o'clock on Friday, which will have communion. Uh, The other's not necessarily connected to Easter, but the clocks go forward next Sunday morning. Uh, So do remember that. Maybe we'll remind each other on uh, the WhatsApp group um, so that we're up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for Easter Sunday morning uh, to come in to worship together. Shall we pray and commit our uh, time to the Lord? Father, we thank you for bringing us together this morning. We thank you for this opportunity uh, to worship you in this way, uh, to sing together, to pray together, to look at your word together, to focus and help each other focus on you and give you the glory that is due to your wonderful, matchless name. Lord, help us by your spirit. Open our eyes to see more of the gospel, to see more of Jesus. Lord, open our hearts uh, to to experience the joy and the wonder of knowing you. And Lord, we pray that if there are, are things within us that you want to deal with this morning, to change us, to bring us back to you, that you would do that. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. In the book of Colossians, Paul writes about his heart for people to see Jesus. He says, I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Here he points out the significance of Jesus. Jesus is the knowledge of God's mystery. He's the complete revelation of who God is, but he is also the complete purpose and plan of God's salvation. Everything centers on Christ. So let's sing of him this morning as we we start our worship. Come behold the wondrous mystery and then name of all majesty. Let's sing of the wonder of Jesus together.
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is sufficient for us here today. He is more than sufficient. He is filled with wisdom and knowledge. In him there is salvation and hope and joy and peace. Lord, fix our eyes on Jesus this morning. Help us to understand how great he is, how wonderful he is. And give us that passion and desire to pursue him in every aspect of our lives. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Good, good. That's what I like to hear. Right. So does anyone remember what our topic is for this kind of series at the moment? Do you remember? Take a guess. It's about people who met Jesus. Say yes. Yes, it is. About people who met Jesus. And we're going to talk about somebody who met Jesus in a few moments' time. But before that... Well, and this person, a miracle happened to them. But before that, I want to perform a miracle here at the front of church. For this, I do need a volunteer. A volunteer. Lois. Come on, Lois. You trust me, right? You trust me. So there's something that you don't know about me. Lucy doesn't know about me. None of my kids know about me. No one knows about me. Do you want to hear it? Did you know, if you squeeze my left foot and tap it three times, chocolate falls down from the sky? (laughs) Should we try and get this miracle to happen this morning? Are you ready? So squeeze my foot, tap it three times, left foot. Ready? Go. See, the, the problem there is that I don't think you really believed it would happen, did you? You need to believe it, okay? You've got to really believe this will happen. Okay, try again. Right, one more time. You've got to believe. You've got to really know this is going to happen. Okay, you believe it, don't you? They don't believe it, but you believe it, don't you? Okay, what last time? No. No, not today. Oh, well, back, back you go. See, she had a lack of faith there, didn't she? <laughs> yeah. It's a lack of faith there. That's, that's what that was, unfortunately. And that's, see, that's what happens, you see. If you have a lack of faith, and also a lack of ability to perform it, <laughs> nothing particularly happens. There's no miracle, there's no excitement There's nothing amazing that happens if you have a lack of faith and a lack of power. But what happens if those two things come together and there's power and there is faith? That's what we're thinking about this morning in the story. Because there was a woman who had been unwell for 12 years. Hands up if you're under 12. So longer than your life... She's been, she was unwell. That's a really, really, really long time. But she thought, hmm, Jesus has power. I know Jesus has power. And if I could just touch his clothes, if I could just touch his cloak, I will be healed. Now that's faith, isn't it? So one day, Jesus was walking along with his disciples, and there was people around him, there was a crowd, there was lots of people around, and she managed to come up behind Jesus and touch his cloak, she was healed instantly because she touched Jesus' cloak. Now, at that point, Jesus said, who touched me? And the disciples said, dude. No, no, they wouldn't say dude. (laughs) Master. (laughs) There's a big crowd. Lots of people touched you. He said, no, someone touched me. I felt power Go out to me. So the disciples started to look around for who it could be. And eventually the woman came forward and she told Jesus her story about how she'd been unwell for 12 years, but by touching his cloak, she became well again. 
And Jesus said, your faith has healed you. You see, Jesus has power. So Jesus isn't over here, no power. Jesus has power. But if the woman had no faith, she'd still be over here. That doesn't make anything amazing happen. But once we combine power with faith, suddenly we have an awesome miracle that this woman was healed. That's an amazing story, isn't it? Now, the question is, what about you? What's, where's your faith? We know Jesus has power, but is your faith over here somewhere? You've got no faith in Jesus. If you do that, no miracle happens. There's nothing amazing that happens. But when you have faith in Jesus, when those two things come together, something amazing happens. All of your sins are washed away. Suddenly, you get to be in God's family. You're forgiven. That is an amazing miracle that can happen when Jesus has power, which he does, and do have faith and believe in that power. So if we have neither of those things, unfortunately, as we saw, no miracle happens at all. But Jesus, having all the power, if we trust in him, then we can be forgiven. Right, so that's today's story. I think next week is the last one of this series. But the woman today, that's quite an exciting story to see all of God's power. Right, we're now going to sing our song, which is, Our God is a Great Big God. So let's sing. Let's just pray before you go back to your parents. Heavenly Father, we pray for all of these children that they would have faith like that woman. They would see how powerful you are and that they would want to be uh, with you, that they would want to be in your family. So Lord God, we pray that they too would have faith in you and they would see your power. We ask this all in your name. Amen. Well, we're going to come uh, to prayer now. I want us to, to focus on knowing Jesus, us knowing Jesus today, think of Easter, uh, and people in our town come in to know Jesus. But also as we pray, um, it's a, a privilege to announce that Jeff and Diana, who've been with us worshipping since about September, October, on Sundays uh, they had a baby girl this week, uh, so uh, when they told me they hadn't chosen a name yet, so it's baby girl at the moment, and a sister for Emma, Esther, and Lydia. So we want to pray for them and pray for their new baby and for their daughters as they grow, that they would come to know Jesus for themselves. So shall we pray together this morning? Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus again. We thank you that he is everything we need. We thank you that he is everything that we could possibly desire. He is the all-sufficient one. We thank you that he has all power and all grace, all mercy and all love. 
We thank you that he is just and righteous. We thank you that he is the perfect king for us to follow. He is the perfect priest to represent us before you. He is the perfect teacher to teach us who you are and your ways. Lord, we want to know him better, to know him more. We pray that that would be the result of our time together today, this morning and this evening. As we, as we see his words to this church in Sardis this morning, as we see his heart displayed for us this evening in that last chapter of Jonah, we pray that we would know him better. Father, we pray over this Easter time, as we get to the heart of things, to his death and resurrection, as we meditate and think and ponder these things. Lord, we pray that you would move our hearts in wonder at Jesus and what he did for us. And Lord, all that that means in our lives today. May we know that he is the greatest treasure that we can ever have. And Lord, we don't only pray this for ourselves. We pray this for our town, for thousands and thousands of people who live here with no knowledge of Jesus. People who have never heard of Jesus or never heard of the biblical Jesus anyway. They maybe heard his name, but it's never been explained to them who he really is. Or maybe it has, but they've moved on from that knowledge. They, they put it away. They've cast it aside. Lord, we fear for our town because without faith in Christ, we are not forgiven. Without faith in Christ, we face eternal judgment. We fear for people. We have compassion for people in our town because of the needs of today and the needs of the future that life would be so different if people only trusted in Jesus. Lord, we pray that through our witness, through the witness of other Christians here in this town, Lord, you would display Christ so clearly that people would see who he is. And that, Lord, you would work in hearts to, uh, to, to open, open that door that people would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Will you build your church for the honour of Jesus' name and for the good of those around us? And, Father, as we gather together, we rejoice with Jeff and Diana. We thank you uh, for the, the new daughter in their family a sister to Emma and Esther and Lydia. Lord, we pray for this baby. We pray that your hand would be upon her, that you would keep her safe, that you would help her to grow. And we pray for all four of these girls, Lord, that as they, as they grow up, that they would grow up into Jesus, that they would love him and trust him and want to follow him. And that, Lord, you would guide them every day of their lives. Lord, we thank you. For all that you have done for us, we thank you for all your goodness. Lord, we commit our lives to you and want to follow you. Amen. Well, we're going to read together the Bible in just a few moments, but uh, just put a slide up first of all, just to remind us, we're going through the book of Revelation. We're currently in this first vision. Um, there's two more letters in the vision for us to, to look at after today. But today we're looking at the letter to the church in Sardis. Um, just to reiterate why I put two in red, two in green, and three in white uh, there. So the, the two in red, uh, your Ephesus and Laodicea, um, they are the two churches that Jesus seems to reserve his harshest comments for, or the harshest judgment. It seems the whole church in those two instances has gone astray from Jesus. For Ephesus, it's because they're focusing on their work and not on love for Jesus. And for Laodicea, it's because they think they're rich. They've, they've imbibed materialism, wealth, money, stuff, 
and they think that that makes their life good rather than having Jesus. And the striking thing to me looking at that is those are are possibly the the biggest threats that we face here as a church, just generally in the West, um, to us and, and our faith in the Lord Jesus. Smyrna and Philadelphia. Smyrna is the persecuted church. Philadelphia, we'll see next two, in two weeks' time, is the little church. Um, they're the ones where Jesus has no criticism, just keep on going and encouragement for them. And then the three in the middle, um, so Pergamon, the compromised church, Thyatira, um, the church with false teaching, and Sardis, the complacent church. These are churches where some of the church have gone with this threat, they've gone astray, but others have stayed faithful. So there's a kind of, um, some of you are doing okay, but others of you need to repent. It's sort of a mixed picture in those churches. So that's why I put um, the red, the green, and the white, um, just to kind of de- delineate that. So we're looking at Sardis today, uh, the fifth of these churches in modern-day Turkey, as uh, Jesus, through John, writes these letters to each of the churches. So if you want to turn to Revelation 3, we're going to read from verses 1 through to 6. Write to the angel of the church in Sardis, thus says the one who has the seven spirits of God, And the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Be alert and strengthen what remains, which is about to die. For I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you are not alert, I will come like a thief. And you have no idea at what hour I will come upon you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. In the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels." Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, before we come and just dive into that together, we're going to sing a a prayer, a prayer for our time in God's Word, that God would speak to us, that we would understand what he's saying, but also that he would transform us in our lives. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. Let's stand and sing.
you want to have your Bible open to Revelation 3, that would be useful, although the verses will also be on the screen behind me. This week I came across a a statement on complacency. It goes like this, complacently, complacently, complacency kills. It finds vulnerability in the comfort of past success and plants itself in the crevices. It waits for you to develop overconfidence, to lose sight of the dangers around you, to become blissfully unaware of the deficiencies you have developed. And then it strikes, slowly, methodically, fatally. Complacency kills. It finds vulnerability in the comfort of past success and plants itself in the crevices. It waits for you to develop overconfidence, to lose sight of the dangers around you, to become blissfully unaware of the deficiencies you have developed, and then it That was part of a blog post talking about companies like Blockbuster Video. How many of you remember Blockbuster Video? They were everywhere. They had thousands and thousands of shops all around the world, but they didn't recognize the problem that the internet would bring. They didn't invest in Netflix when they had their chance. They were complacent about their business strategy. And where is Blockbuster Video today? I think there is one Blockbuster Video in the world left, but it isn't owned by Blockbuster Video. Complacency kills. What's the problem in the church in Sardis? What is the problem that the church there faces? It is spiritual complacency. They are relying on a reputation. Verse 1 puts it, I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive. Here's their reputation. When people hear the name Sardis and church, they think, oh, that's an amazing church. And they thought, well, we're an amazing church. We don't have to try anymore. And what did that mean? It meant that they went on a slippery road, the road of complacency, which by the time Jesus is writing this letter, is almost at the point of complete fatality. You are dead. Although from verse 3, it's mostly dead. There's still something that can be revived. You are dead. But if you don't take anything else away from this morning, take this. Spiritual complacency is a dangerous condition to have. If you come before Dr. Jesus and he gives you a diagnosis and he says you are spiritually complacent, that is not something a paracetamol will deal with. That is serious stuff. So have in the back of your mind as we go through this letter, are you, am I... Spiritually complacent. Because I, if I am, I either need to repent or, or I'm walking a path that goes in a direction I don't want. I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. How can we avoid spiritual complacency? Or... Let's put it this way. How can we come back from a position of spiritual complacency? What can we do? What do we learn from this letter? What instruction does Jesus give us that will help us to battle the threat of spiritual complacency, that threat that seeks to extinguish our faith and witness here in Whittlesea? There are three instructions from this letter. The first is this. Stay awake. Stay awake. That that should be somewhere in every sermon. Stay awake. Stay awake. It's there, isn't it, in verse 2. Be alert, he says. Literally, wake up. The reputation of the church in Sardis has been kind of like a lullaby. 
you know, if you've been in that situation where there's a baby, you want the baby to go to sleep, you sing it a, a soft, uh, sweet sounding song, and eventually the baby goes, eventually the baby goes to sleep. Well, the reputation of Sardis has been like this, this lullaby. Oh, we're doing okay. We're doing fine. Everything's going great. Because five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, this happened. Aren't we an amazing church? And now they're sleeping. They've switched off. They're no longer pursuing Christ actively. They're no longer seeking to reach out with the gospel. And what does Jesus do? Jesus comes along and takes them by the shoulders and he shakes them vigorously. Wake up, he says. Why? Because switching off is fatal. Switching off in the Christian faith, switching off as a church is fatal. Isn't that what he says? You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Have you ever driven when you're really tired? I think the most tired I've been driving is was a, a, a trip that we took to Canada, and we came and we landed at Gatwick, uh, so at eight o'clock, nine in the morning. Uh, you haven't slept because you've been on the plane. I can't sleep on planes, so I haven't slept all night. Landed at Gatwick, and then we had to drive to Swansea, which is about six-hour drive. Um, in the traffic around London and then, and then getting across. A really long drive to Swansea. And I remember driving along the M4. I've got to get my roads right. The M4. And uh, as I'm driving along, there is this kind of feeling. My eyes are just so desperate to close and go to sleep. But I'm on the motorway. And there's cars everywhere. And I know if I go to sleep, it's not going to be good. It's not going to work out well. So you have to pull off, don't you? When you feel like that, you pull off. The next service is, and you, you get some coffee, and you have a rest, and you, you build up for the next stage of the journey. Because tiredness kills, as it says on the sign as you go along the motorway. As Christians, we are not in a cotton wool world where there are no dangers. We're told in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, be sober-minded, be alert, wake up. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. The devil is out to get you, Peter says. Don't go to sleep. Because switching off is fatal. If you ever say, it's not going to happen to me. Oh, that problem I read in the Bible, it can never happen to me. You're putting a nail in the coffin. Switching off is fatal. Secondly, switching off means we won't finish the journey. Switching off means we won't finish the journey. Look at the end of verse 2. I have not found your works complete before my God. What does he say there? What does he mean by that? Look, you started well, and you did something well, but you haven't finished yet. You haven't completed it yet. You can't stop because at the first step it went well. You've got to follow it through to the end. It's like a, an 100-meter runner in the Olympics thinking, wow, I've done a good stop, a good start. I can stop now. No, you've got to run through to the tape. You've got to run through to the end. Or, or those of you who are at school, year 10 and year 11, if you're there, you're doing your GCSEs. If you're not quite there yet, you will be in year 10 and 11 and doing your GCSEs. Imagine this. You start your mass GCSE in year 10, in September, and at the end of September, you have a class test, and you ace your class test. You get 97%. 97 percent. 97 because there's still room for improvement, OK? But 97 percent. Imagine you think, "Wow, well, I got 97 percent in the first test in mass GCSE. I don't need to do any more work. I don't need to come to school. I can just go straight to the GCSE now because I got 97% in the first test. It doesn't work like that. You've got so much more to learn. You've got so much more to do. If you stop there, you will never complete your mass GCSE. And that's what Jesus is saying here. If you stop just because you did something well at the beginning... You'll never get to the end. 
Paul gives us a different attitude in Philippians 3. He says, not that I have already reached the goal or I'm already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. He said, Christ Jesus has taken hold of me for a reason. And so I'm going to push through to, to complete what it is. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. In the Christian life, there is always a reaching out for more, for more of God, for more of Jesus, for for more to do in his kingdom, for more to know of him. If we stop reaching out for more, it's like we're taking our foot off the accelerator in the car. What happens when you take your foot off the accelerator in the car? You start coasting. And you just start drifting and getting slower and slower and slower and slower. And you don't get to the end of your journey. You stop halfway there. That's the picture that Jesus gives here the church in Sardis. Your complacency means you're not going to get to the end. You're going to stop halfway there. And then thirdly, switching off means we're not ready for Jesus. In verse 3, if you are not alert, if you are not awake, I will come like a thief. And you have no idea at what hour I will come upon you. What's Jesus talking about here? In what way will he come? There are three ways I think we could could understand this. Um, One, we could understand it as the return of Christ. Jesus talks about his return with this metaphor of a thief coming in the night. You will not know when he will come until he arrives. So be ready. Although I don't think that's primarily in view here. but But it is part of it. It could be that he comes to, to, take you, to take your life in the sense that your death comes. And then there's judgment. Or it could be, and I think this is most likely, Jesus comes to call you to account. And if he finds you not walking with him, then there is discipline or, or maybe an unveiling of your lack of faith. Whichever of those it is, and I think it's probably most likely the end, to encounter Jesus in those situations and not be ready, not be seeking him, not be following him, be drifting in faith, it is not going to end well for us. We don't want to kind of drift into eternity, because I'm not sure you can do that. Because there will be all kinds of questions. Are you really believing in Jesus? Switching off means we're not ready for Jesus. If we want to maintain faith and witness, we need to stay awake. That's true for all of us as individuals. Let's go back a a couple of weeks to... um, Pergamon, and we talked about uh, the threat there of diluting Jesus uh, and the threat there of of other gods, other things becoming as important to us as Jesus uh, and being put alongside him. Uh, And one of those that we we considered uh, in our day and age was the the God of pleasure and leisure. There's all kinds of ways in which that works it out. It could be entertainment or sport or music, those kinds of things where where we we pursue those passionately But how tempting it is, and we ask, where's the line where those things start to become as important to us as Jesus? In my experience, as I enjoy those things in my life, um, there's often a point at which they do conflict with Jesus and they do conflict with church. And we're faced with a choice. What's more important? What do we go with? Let me just give you an illustration to make it a bit more concrete. In the the autumn, I started running. I've been enjoying running. But I knew the way I work in things and the way I approach things, if I started doing it, I wanted to do it kind of of properly. And that would probably lead to maybe me entering some races, like a half marathon or something at some point. But here's the problem. 
with running and as well as other sports, most half marathons are on a Sunday, on a Sunday morning. And so you can't run in those half marathons and be at church. So I knew that that would be an issue later down the line. So right from the start, because I also know that in my mind, uh, if, if I do something, I, I not obsess over it, but I kind of, I want to do it properly so it, becomes, it can become a big thing. So right from the start, I said, I will never run a race on a Sunday. That, that's the decision I take. I'm not saying everyone must make that decision, but for me, that's the way that I keep that clarity of Christ being first and this is second. But here's the thing. That isn't a decision that you make a few months ago and that's it. Now, it's a decision I have to make every day. It's a decision I have to make every time I hear about the Peterborough Half Marathon or the Cambridge Half Marathon that I run on a Sunday or, or, or other races. It's a decision that will have to be made day after day after day after day. And if I switch off, then I will slip into making the wrong one. I can't say, because I made that decision a few months ago, I'm never going to get it wrong today. Or because I made that decision over running, I'll never get it wrong on anything else. If we switch off, we won't stand for Jesus. Just because you made the right choice once is no guarantee you will make the right choice again. To maintain faith and witness, we need to stay awake. It's the same for us as a church. You know, we had our church anniversary, 255 years. 255 years of standing on the true gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a, a, that's a long time, a long time of faithfulness, a long time of the truth being proclaimed, day, week after week, from the front of this church building. But the fact that we have 255 years behind us is no guarantee that it will be the gospel that is proclaimed today. So you can't say, well, we haven't fallen in 255 years into false teaching, so we won't fall into false teaching now. Because the moment you switch off, the devil will find a crevice that he can widen and work in. We need to stay awake if we want to maintain faith and witness. That's the first thing Jesus says. Secondly, how do we avoid spiritual complacency? Stay active. Stay active. Look at verse 3. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you want to get fit, what do you need to do? You need to exercise. And as you exercise, your body changes and you become fitter. Uh, it change in various ways, but you'll become fitter and able to do more and you can do more exercise. So as you exercise, your body becomes fit. But, but when you get to that point that you say, I'm now fit, okay? I, I'm as fit as I want to be, what do you need to do then? You need to exercise. Because if you stop exercising, you will become unfit. So you have to keep on exercising to keep that fitness. You can't say, well, I'm fit now, so I don't need to do anything. And in five years' time, say, well, I was fit then, so I'm okay. No, you've got to keep on exercising. And we see that here as Jesus talks to the church in Sardis. It's not just wake up, it's exercise. You've got to keep exercising every day. You've got to go through the spiritual exercises. What are they? Well, they're there in verse 3. Remember the truth of Christ. Remember then what you have received and heard. What is it that they've received and heard? It's the truth of Jesus. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the word remember here is not an inactive word. It's not do you remember the truth of Jesus? Oh, yes. I, I, oh, yeah, it's about Jesus. It's about the cross. It's, didn't he die and rise again? It's not do you remember it? It's remember it. Active, remember it, bring it to your mind, meditate on it, think on it, fill your life with it. 
I was thinking of that. I was remembering a, a, a passage in the book of Deuteronomy. It's God is talking to the people of Israel and explaining how they should deal with his word, his truth. He says this, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. Notice five things they are to do with the word of God. Listen, repeat, talk, bind, write. All of those things are given to the people of Israel so that they might actively, every single day, remember the truths of God. Not just leave them on the side, but bring them constantly into their life. That the word of God might be the constant soundtrack to the film of their lives. Constantly in the background, in the foreground, here is the word of God. And we are to be like that too. Jesus says, remember. Bring to mind constantly the truths of Christ. Well, that's the first spiritual exercise. The second spiritual exercise, obey the truths of Christ. Keep it. Don't just remember it. Keep it. This is really important. Jesus, as he taught, was very clear with the people who were listening that listening to his message was not enough. Their lives had to be transformed by his message. Do you remember the parable of the two builders, the wise builder and the foolish builder? Jesus told that parable. There was a foolish builder who built his house on the sand, and when the storm came, the house collapsed and then the wise builder who built his house on the rock and when the storm came the house stood still um, and, and stood firm now, there's lots of ways in which people apply that and talk about what are you building your house on and things like that ultimately though that's not Jesus point Jesus point is to display the foolishness of the fool and the wisdom of the wise the fool well he builds a house and it's on the sand you all know that's laughed and the wise man, well, he builds on a foundation, and you all know that's good. He's got these, the fool is a fool, and the wise man is a wise man, and he's got our hearts understanding that, yeah, the fool, he's, he's completely bananas. And that, that wise man, well, that's what I want to be like. Well, what's the fool? The fool is the person who listens to what Jesus says and doesn't keep it. The fool is the person who comes every Sunday to church and listens to the preaching but never does anything about it. The wise man is the one who listens and does what it says. And so here's a spiritual exercise. Not just remember, 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 but keep. Put it into action. Live it out in your life. And then the third spiritual exercise, repent. Repent when we don't live up to the truths of Christ. Remember, keep, repent. We make a lot of repentance when it comes to someone becoming a Christian, that point where they give their life to Jesus. And rightly so, Acts 2 verse 38, as the people cry out, what must we do to be saved? Peter says, repent and be baptized. Each of you in the name of Jesus of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When someone becomes a Christian, repentance is key. But repentance doesn't end being key at the point when someone becomes a Christian. Repentance is to be the daily practice of the Christian. I don't know if you've ever been uh, to the Alps in Europe and up a mountain pass. Because the, the, the mountains are steep, and the, as the roads go up, they don't go straight up. They go in zigzags across with lots of hairpin bends. I, I remember one day going on a coach trip over the passes from Switzerland, from Davos, into Italy. 
And uh, because my sister and I were the only children on the coach trip, uh, we got invited to go and sit in the little seat by the driver at the front. What I didn't realize was that if you're in a coach, the front wheels are set back quite a long way from the front of the coach. And to get around the corner, the driver had to drive over the edge and then round the corner. So every time we got to a bend, I was sitting looking directly down with nothing beneath me. I was petrified. I am scared of heights as well. I was petrified. Let's come back to those mountain passes with the hairpin bends. Ideally, in the top of the mountain with Jesus. And here we are. Ideally, we want a straight path that goes directly to Jesus. That's what we're aiming for. But in reality, it doesn't work like that. In reality, we drift to the right. But then we're supposed to repent, do a 180, and come back. But then we drift to the left, and then we're supposed to repent. And we drift, and we do. our life is to be a life It should look like that mountain pass. Coming back on ourselves, coming back on ourselves, coming back on ourselves, as we drift away from Jesus, but then repent and come back to him. And Jesus says that is a spiritual exercise that we should be taking part in every single day. Remember the truth of Christ, obey the truth of Christ, and repent when we don't live up to the truths of Christ. If we want to maintain a vibrant faith and not drift into complacency, we need to stay active. Active in remembering the gospel. Active in obeying the gospel. Active in repenting where we've gone astray from the gospel. Let's think of ourselves as a church. Okay? If we think of the last seven to eight years, we've gone through a period of some growth. So if we go back eight years, we had about 53, 54 members, something like that. We have now about 80 members. A period of growth. As we go back um, seven, eight years, we were starting to fill up downstairs, but no one upstairs, but now we're we're filling up downstairs and upstairs. We've gone through a period of growth. What's the temptation that comes with that? A feeling of being comfortable. It's quite nice. Every Sunday we come, there's, there's a good number of people here. We're not constantly reminded by empty pews that there's space. And there's people in the town who aren't coming. The temptation then is to lose that evangelistic urgency. But it's quite nice now, isn't it? We've got enough people to do the jobs that need to be done, so why, why bother going out and getting any more? It's a very dangerous place to be. That feeling of comfortableness that leads to a loss of evangelistic urgency, it leads to fatality. Why? Someone once said to me, every church, no matter how big, every church is one generation away from closure. Every church is one generation away from closing the doors. We need to remember the gospel. That this message of Jesus is not just for us, it's for the world. He came to gather all, all people from tribes and tongues and nations into his kingdom. That he is not happy that any should perish. That he has people in this town who he has chosen from eternity past who need to hear the gospel and be gathered in. And he has called us as his church to do that. We need to remember and we need to obey what Jesus has said. It works on a church level, but also for us as individuals. Maybe you've gone through in your life over the last few months a a growth in your walk with the Lord. Maybe a growth in battle with sin. There's something that you were struggling with. But God's given you a victory. And it seems that while that was very much at the fore and very much the thing that was, was, con- 
the thing you were convicted over all the time, but, but now you, you've been able to move past it in the strength of God. That's great if that's happened. But there's a temptation that comes with it. And the temptation is this. I can deal with sin. I'm okay. That that big problem's gone. I'm now fine. And you stop asking God to, to show you your sin. You stop asking for his help with your sin. And the result is you become desensitized to sin because you no longer see it as a sin and you draw away from the Lord. To maintain a vibrant faith, we need to stay active, looking at the scriptures, remembering what God has said, obeying the scriptures, seeking to put it into practice, and repenting. Asking God to show us our sin, that we might repent of it and turn back to Jesus. So we need to stay awake, stay active, thirdly, stay focused. Verse 4, but you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, Who are these people? These are the people who have not taken on spiritual complacency. Here are the people who are still seeking actively to follow Jesus every day. They've kept their eyes on Jesus. They're seeking Jesus. They're following Jesus. And Jesus encourages these people. He encourages them in their walk, and he encourages others to focus on him as they have done. How does he do that? He reminds us of two things. The first is this. Jesus is the one who equips us for eternity. Jesus is the one who equips us for eternity. You have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes. Those who haven't fallen into spiritual complacency. And they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. What does he mean when he says, walk with me in white? I think what he means is this. They will be equipped with the clothes for eternity. We think of eternity at the end of Revelation, the new heavens and the new earth. We're told very clearly it's it's not a place for sin. And it's not a place for sinners. It's not a place for sin. And it's not a place for sinners. Hang on, I know you're called. Oh, oh, where's he going with this? That means it's not a place for me. Yeah, it's not a place for me. If I remain outside of Christ. But if I come and put my faith in Christ, what happens? All the filthy rags of my sin are washed away in the, blood of his, uh, in the blood of Christ through his death and through his resurrection. And his perfection is put on me. The clothes are white. And now I can live in eternity with Jesus. I mentioned running earlier. One of the downsides of running is you get a bit sweaty. So I come home from a run Um, maybe you're not like this, but my clothes are a little bit damp and and I'm rather stinky. And it's not really appropriate in our house to remain in that condition. I I think there would be a few complaints from various people if I just decided to come home from the run and then live for the rest of the day in those clothes. Now I have to get rid of them, take them off, and have a shower, get clean, and put on new clothes. All of those occasions, there's loads of occasions like that in our life. All of them are are little pictures of the reality of the gospel. As sin has to be taken off, there's no place for sin, and therefore no place for sinners in eternity. But there is a place for sinners who have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus and wearing his white robes of perfection. Jesus is the one who equips us for eternity. And Jesus says, for those of you who have not fallen foul, have not fallen to the thread of spiritual complacency, you will wear the white robes with me. But then look at the next verse. This is incredible. In the same way, the one who conquers. Who is the one who conquers? In the context here, it is not 
The one who hasn't fallen to the thread of spiritual complacency. Jesus has already spoken about them. In the same way, this is another group who will also receive something. In the same way, the one who conquers is the one who's fallen but repented. The one who was relying on the reputation of being alive but was almost dead but has turned back to the Lord. What will Jesus do for them? They will be dressed in white clothes too. Exactly the same reward. That's the grace of the gospel. That's the grace of Jesus. If we fall, that does not disqualify us from the kingdom. If we repent, Jesus will gather us in. Jesus is the one who equips us for eternity. So focus on Jesus, he said. Secondly, and Jesus is the one who secures eternity for us. So that in the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes and I will never erase his name from the book of life. But will acknowledge his name before my father and before his angels. I wonder if you've ever gone to a wedding reception. And uh, as you go in, it's normally there's, there's this seating plan, isn't there? What table am I on? A seating plan. I wonder if you've ever gone and looked at the seating plan and not found your name. If you haven't, I don't think I have, but I can imagine it. Where's my name? Am I really invited? Have I been knocked off? Did they not tell me? Can you imagine getting to eternity and the book of life is opened and you thought for all of your life here your name was in it and yet as the list is read you're not there that seems to be the problem that the church in Sardis is potentially facing. A reputation for being alive. Our name's in the book of life. Look, look at what happened in the past, but you're dead. It's just a reputation. But for those who seek Christ and seek him to the end, the one who conquers Jesus will never take their name out of the book of life. And not only will it be there in the book, but Jesus will announce to you before his father. Here is my brother. Here is my sister. Here is my follower. Here is part of my bride. Come on. Come into eternal glory. There's a lovely word play in this letter that doesn't come out so much in the English. The word reputation is name in the verse 1. You have a name for being alive. When we come to verse 4, but you have a few people, it's you have a few names. A few names who have not given in, not relied on a name for, for, for being alive, but are actually dead. No, these are people who are really alive. And then when we come to verse 5, there's, this word name is twice. The name in the book of life and the name that is acknowledged before my Father. And it's as if God is giving us a choice here in this letter. Do you want a name that has a reputation for being alive? Or do you want a name that is truly connected to life? Do you want one just with the reputation? Or do you want the reality? How do you get the reality? By trusting Jesus, by staying awake, by actively following him, staying focused on him. You see, for us as individuals, it's so easy to drift away from Jesus. You know, I put my hand up when I got to last summer. That, that would have been me. I was drifting away from Jesus. Yeah, I was here every week. I was preaching every week. I was going through the, the, the motions, I'd say, of ministering. But in my heart, it was slowly becoming drier and drier. 
And I was so thankful for that time of sabbatical, and God was really kind to me to help me to refocus and be refreshed. But, but here's the thing today. Do I look back on that time and say, well, I was refocused and refreshed, so I'm okay now? And the result of that will be, I drift again. Or do I say, that was a blessed time, that was a, a gracious time, God was so kind. And I need to maintain that in his grace. And I need to grow on that in his grace and continue that in his grace. And so every day I need to remember the gospel and lean on him and look to him and seek him and be active in my faith. Do I become complacent because of something God has done in the past or do I keep on going. For us as a church, we think of Ephesus, the first letter, the heart drift that took place there. They love Jesus, but now they don't love Jesus. They became focused on their work. They became focused on the stuff they could do rather than looking to Jesus. A question that's been on my mind a lot in the last few months. It concerns our Sunday meetings, really. It's I want to put it simply, it's this. Are our Sunday meetings important? And one of the reasons for asking that is because they're very important to me in my workflow. My whole week, about 75% of my work is about Sunday. Getting ready for Sunday, preparing for Sunday, uh, doing everything for Sunday. So my workflow, my week, my, uh, everything I do it points towards Sunday. But is it important for all of us? Is this vital for every one of us? And the Bible says yes. The Bible says it's important to meet together. It's important to come under God's word. It's important to sing together. It's important to pray together. Why? Because these are the times when we point each other to Jesus. If you think of a... a, of a photographer with a camera and they might focus on a picture but then the next picture they have to refocus it the next picture they have to refocus it as we go through life we need those moments of being refocused on Christ and when we meet together on a Sunday that is the best moment we have each week to be refocused on Christ and can't be replaced by doing it on our own there's something different about doing it together If we want to stay alive, we need these times. We need God to bless these times that we are looking to Jesus. Don't give in to spiritual complacency. Stay awake, stay active, stay focused. Let me just end with verse 1. What do we see of Jesus here? Thus says the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. What does he have? He has the seven spirits of God. That's the Holy Spirit, the life-giving spirit. And then the seven stars, that's the seven angels. Who are the angels? Well, I've already said many times, we don't know. It's, it's, it's not clear. What are the angels, though? Actually, that is quite clear, because the word angels means messenger. And as we see them in these two chapters, these are the ones who bring the message of Jesus to his church. So what do we have here? We have the life-giving spirit of God and the message of Jesus. If we seek every week the work of the life-giving spirit of God and the words of the message of Jesus, if we are open to the work of the life-giving Spirit of God and the message of Jesus, if we have the work of the life-giving Spirit of God and the message of Jesus, would that make a difference as we battle spiritual complacency? Or, or let's make it more often, daily. If we seek the Spirit and the Word, if we are open to the Spirit and the Word, if we have the Spirit and the Word, will that make a difference as we fight and the threat of spiritual complacency. Who has those two things in his hands today? Jesus. Let's come and ask for his help. Father, as we look at Jesus, the one who holds the spirit and the word, 
and is ready to send them to our aid, to work in us, to call us back, to strengthen us, to encourage us, we come and ask for him to work in us. We see the danger of spiritual complacency. We do not want to take that path. We see the need to be active, yet we are too weak so often. And we, we see that focus that we ought to have that looks to Jesus. Lord, work that in us, we pray. Amen. Let's stand to sing as a prayer. Breathe on me, breath of God. It's a prayer for the Holy Spirit to come and revive our hearts. Let's stand and sing. We thank you for this time this morning. We thank you for our time now uh, with refreshments. Help us to encourage each other in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, And be with us through this day. Help us to look to him, to know him more, and Lord, to understand and see how we can put your word into practice in our lives. Amen.